One of the ways that Fire Emblem has set itself apart from other strategy RPG series is having a large cast of fun anime characters who are theoretically supposed to be enjoyable to spend time with. This has been the case since Fire Emblem 1, but as the stories and graphical capabilities of the games have gotten more complex, we have been able to have more and more complicated characters in these anime chess games. Whether it's brain-dead himbos like Gonzalez, unhinged members of royalty like La Rochelle, or just regular old guys like Trek and Noah, the people who we spend the majority of our game time with are a large part of the appeal of Fire Emblem. And seeing the ways that the cast interact with each other and sometimes even end up in paired endings is an appeal to a large amount of the Fire Emblem fanbase, myself included. With this in mind, it was only a matter of time before Fire Emblem started implementing aspects of the dating simulator genre into its gameplay. While I personally am not a huge fan of the dating simulator genre, I know that it is a popular one and there is definitely a large fan diagram between Fire Emblem fans and fans of dating simulators. And so the Avatar character was born. And while on the surface the self-insert mages seem like a way to put yourself in the world of Fire Emblem, I think the core appeal, or at least the intended core appeal, was to rope in people who want to date these fun anime characters. And look, I'm not going to pretend to be the target audience for the dating simulator aspect of Fire Emblem, but I also don't think there's anything wrong with being attracted to the anime character you go on an 80 plus hour adventure with, as long as they are a consenting adult anime character, that is. Still, with the addition of avatars comes avatar dating, and with the addition of avatar dating comes the question of the avatar's sexuality. They, almost by default, have to be able to be bisexual or pansexual, just so that they can open up romance options to both straight and gay viewers. But, well, when you have a self-insert who's able to date various members of the cast, things get really complicated really quickly. So, this is SRPG Suffix, a video series where we take a look at all things queer Fire Emblem. And for today's video, we are going to be diving in the history of Avatar dating and how it has had knock-on effects to the paired endings, romances, supports, and all of those aspects of Fire Emblem. As a quick disclaimer, I do want to get out of the way. The name of this series is SRPG Sapphics, and it was originally intended to just be about queer women in Fire Emblem. However, I have since decided that that is a bit too narrow of a topic. I want to talk about all LGBT people in Fire Emblem. I am still going to be calling the series SRPG Suffix mostly because I really like alliteration, but expect future videos to cover men and non-binary people. So yeah, hope y'all are looking forward to that, but let's dive into the hot mess of avatars and dating and all of that fun stuff that's definitely going to lead to a very civil comment section. Part 1. A History of Fire Emblem Avatars and Dating Simulation Technically, Mark is the first avatar, however, they are much closer to a figment of Lin's imagination than a full-fledged character, so we're going to start our analysis at Chris. Whenever talking about New Mystery, it's worth bearing in mind that there is some debate as to the accuracy of the current English translation of New Mystery, in particular as it comes to the supports, which are especially relevant for our purposes because most of what we get about Chris is from support conversations. For the purposes of this video, I am going to be assuming that the current FE12 English translation is accurate, but I do like to make the disclaimer that there is some debate as to the level or degree of accuracy versus, like, liberties that the team took. Chris has supports with every single character in the mystery save for the final four clerics, and for the majority of these characters, they are their only support, which often leads to Chris taking on a sort of straight man-esque role in the wacky anime conversations for other people's traits to bounce off of. Despite this, they don't end up being a heterosexual straight man. There's plenty of queer overtones and undertones in a lot of Chris's conversations, whether they be support convos or even some boss conversations in the prologue. Whether it's the close relationship with Katarina, Mathis saying lesbian rights, or the female Chris and Fina conversation that I'm probably going to have to devote an entire video to, there's quite a lot of sapphic stuff in Fire Emblem 12. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that male Chris also has some gay stuff going on, in particular with his super close relationship with Marth. This is something that we see echoed 
in male Robin to Crom's relationship. But before we talk about the first English Avatar in the series, I do want to note one rather unique thing about Chris, and that is that a large number, not all, but a large number of Chris's support conversations do change depending on their gender. Now, in some cases, these changes are minor, such as calling Chris a lass or a lad, depending on whether they are a girl or a boy. But in other instances, their gender does have a pretty significant impact on the conversation. For example, in their support line with Marth, if you are using a female avatar, they will talk about how fighting in the arena isn't something that's particularly feminine, and appear concerned about the fact that they are revealing that they're not as feminine as a traditional woman. I bring this up because in modern Fire Emblem, the avatar's gender is customizable, but this has very little impact, if any at all, on the dialogue in either the main story or the supports that they have. The gender does determine who you are able to get into romantic relationships with, but that's about the extent of the role it has. If you're a male or female who's romancing Linhart, you'll have basically the same conversation with them through every step of the way. Speaking of romance, Chris is also unique in that attribute. Whereas the other avatars could all have paired endings with virtually any member of the cast, Chris is incapable of doing that. In fact, Chris only has two separate endings. One where they succeed and fade away into the background of history, and the other one where they die protecting Marth because you got the bad ending. Not even whether or not you rescued Katarina and completed Chris's various side stories has an impact on their ending, which is a little bit bizarre to me. Like, we weren't fully in Dating Simulator Emblem at this time, but it does feel kind of weird that you have very close to a static ending. It's not like paired endings began with Awakening. These were the case also in the GBA era, and even Fire Emblem 4 had a variation on paired endings. Still, speaking of Awakening, let's dive into Robin. By far, the biggest difference between the roles that Robin and Chris have as avatars of their perspective games is Robin is capable of getting married. This should come as no surprise as Awakening marked the first major uptick in dating simulator elements in Fire Emblem, but Robin can get married to any character in the game. Well, any hetero character in the game. Except for their kid, of course. You can marry your best friend's kid, or any other character's kids, but not yours because, you know, that would be incest. And also you need to get married to have a kid because we're good Christians here in Fjar Future Arcanea, and we wait until marriage to have sex. The fact that Awakening was so focused on child units and the generational time travel mechanics makes it kind of the logical conclusion that everyone would end up in hetero relationships, but it is still a little bit frustrating from a queer perspective. There's not too many characters with queer undertones, but female Robin and Tharsha definitely have some, and male Robin and Krom definitely have some. And I feel justified in those pairings in particular because they are ones that the future games Fire Emblem Fates and Fire Emblem Engaged seemed to semi-canonize. There's some other queer stuff going on, for example, Krom and Frederick are a very common ship for a reason, but not much of it involves Robin. It is worth noting that Robin is, to my mind, the farthest the Avatar has gotten from being a blank slate in all of Fire Emblem. They have a very established personality and very established relationships with some of the other main characters. This is true of all of the Avatars to an extent, but Robin feels the most extreme, as they really are their own full-fledged person, and their personality comes out in spades in the supports. Speaking of the supports, since this is kind of what we're here to look at, Robin's supports don't really change much whether you're male or female, which is extra weird considering that there's no bisexual romances. C, B, and A supports are shared amongst male and female Robin, with the only <laughs> variations being gendered terms and pronouns and stuff like that, but the entire conversation being basically identical aside from that, which is really weird because then if you happen to be the opposite gender, that conversation leads to a romance in the S support, but if you're same gender, it doesn't. I understand that male and female Robin are the same character, and therefore keeping the support writing basically exactly the same is an easy way to cut costs and pretty justifiable within universe, but I do think there are also some instances where Robin's gender would have an impact on how the support plays out. For example, Robin is pretty clearly meant to be heterosexual, but Tharja has a giant lesbian crush on her that is undeniable. 
Additionally, I don't think it would be unreasonable for Robin to react differently when Crom walks in on them showering, depending on whether they're both guys or Robin is a girl. Like, yes, they are the same person, but also these are interactions where gender is definitely at play, so it's a little bit weird that it doesn't get altered at all based on that. Or, if not weird, at the very least worth commenting on. So even though children were no longer an essential part of the story of Fire Emblem Fates, the marriage and children system remained a very big part of the gameplay and was a huge appeal for people as they added an expanded face touching petting simulator thing. Um, and extra incest, yay, we love that. Uh, yeah, that's super fun and great. Uh, the one good thing that came out of the transition from Robin to Corrin, however, is we got, say it with me, two whole gay options. And they were also both route locked. Uh, if you wanted to be a lesbian, I hope you enjoy Birthright and also having sex with a second generation unit. If you want to be a gay man, then I guess you miss out on two potential child unit recruits because you can't adopt Nina or Kana for some reason. While theoretically we should celebrate gay options at all, since there were no gay options in Awakening, it is frustrating that there were so few and they come at a distinct gameplay disadvantage. If you want to be homosexual, you miss out on characters. It also doesn't help that Fates has a number of other queer or queer-adjacent characters, almost all of whom are handled very poorly, so it just sort of leaves a sour taste in my mouth when it comes to talking about the queer content in Fates. Last thing that I want to bring up is that much like in Awakening, supports are not altered depending on whether you're male Corrin or female Corrin, and this extends to the gay S supports, which are basically identical to their straight counterparts, with the exception of altering man for woman and she for he and so on and so forth depending on your gender. This is frustrating for the same reasons that I went over in Awakening, so I won't rehash that, but it continues to be a thing going forward. So then we move on to Three Houses, which is quite possibly the gayest Fire Emblem game that we've ever had. A large number of the cast are either heavily implied or outright confirmed to be queer of some flavor. However, out of all of those characters, only six are capable of entering into a same-sex relationship with Byleth. Now on its own, I'm actually perfectly fine with this. I think it's additive when there are characters who you just cannot marry as an avatar. For example, Gilbert and Aloy both being in loving relationships with someone other than Byleth, regardless of whether Byleth is male or female, is nice. I think that there's value in non-romantic paired endings, and I think that there's value in characters who just can't be young single people to marry the avatar. However, where we run into an issue is that these characters who are confirmed to be queer and do have queer endings with other characters, such as Manuela, are able to marry male Byleth but not female Byleth, or vice versa for the queer men. Or at least that's what I would say if there were any confirmed queer men that Byleth is not allowed to have a paired male ending with, because unfortunately that's just not the case. This game does definitely have some queer-coded men who Byleth doesn't have a paired ending with, such as Claude, or Claude, or Claude, or Claude, or bisexual icon Claude. Um, I'm not bitter. At all. Whatsoever. Nope. Definitely not. But, yeah, the only confirmed queer characters that you cannot get into a queer relationship with are women, which kind of feeds into Three Houses' other problem, and that is the noticeably larger amount of sapphic content as opposed to male queer content. And look, I know that the series is titled SRPG Sapphics, and the idea was initially just sort of to take a look at queer women, but I quickly realized that queerness in general was a topic that I wanted to cover with this series. SRPG Sapphics, just because I have an obsession with alliteration, and I think it's still a catchy title. As a result, I do think it's important to criticize the way in which Three Houses kind of neglects queer males. Because while three lesbian paired endings was still incredibly small, and let's be honest, probably smaller than it should have been, it was still three times bigger than the number of male queer endings that we had available before DLC. And part of me wants to say that that comes down to the idea that lesbians are more acceptable because cishet men tend to find lesbians hot, and so including more explicit lesbian pairings and explicit lesbian characters was sort of a male gazy way of being like, hey, we're gonna do some queer stuff, but it's okay, it's the hot 
queer stuff. It's not those gross queer men. And like, thankfully the numbers were evened out with the DLC, but it is still frustrating that at base, there was such a disparity, especially since they initially presented the Aloy and Gilbert pairings as the other queer male pairings, despite the fact that they were two of the non-romantic pairings that you could do. It was, uh, it was very frustrating. But yeah, overall, Three Houses was definitely an improvement in the queer romance options, as well as the queered pair endings for non-Avatar characters, but there's still some criticisms. And as always, I feel the need to emphasize that the supports don't change very much depending on the gender, even the romantic ones don't change, yada yada yada. Okay, so now we move on to Elyr and Engage's paired endings in general, and things get really weird here, because... Paired endings were, for the most part, actually removed from Engage, which is so bizarre to think about since they've been a staple since the GBA era. But yeah, the majority of characters cannot have paired endings. The only character who's capable of being paired is Aaliyah, and they can pair with anyone, but no character can pair with anyone other than Aaliyah. Additionally, the pairings are not altered between male and female Aaliyah and most of them are not explicitly romantic, but instead sort of a vague, maybe a friendship, maybe a romance, maybe something in between. This does mean that the majority of the cast is kind of queer-coded, but they're also all Aaliyah sexuals, and I don't really like that. It makes them feel less like fully fleshed out complete characters, and more like just little playthings for the player to choose which one they like the most and marry. Part 2, Romance in the Dragon Age series. Okay, so a seemingly unrelated series that I have a love-hate relationship is Dragon Age. It's a series of games where you create an RPG avatar and gather party members to try to save medieval fantasy world from unspecified disaster. It's not important that you know too much about the game other than the fact that you have several party members and some of those party members are romanceable by the avatar character. In the first game, this presents itself as four potential romance options. A heterosexual man, a heterosexual woman, a bisexual man, and a bisexual woman. While the game doesn't have character endings in the exact same way as Fire Emblem, it's a very similar system and which character you romance with the avatar will impact their character endings. However, it's hard to talk about the Dragon Age 1 romances without mentioning the sex scenes, as these were seemingly the main appeal of the romances, and they were pretty crude. They were titillating, they were very male gazy, and it oftentimes felt like you were just pumping the party members full of gifts in order to unlock sex scenes with them. Not the greatest look, and Bioware knew that they needed to touch things up for the sequel Dragon Age 2. The first thing they did was remove the sex scenes, which I personally think is a positive change. I don't think that sex in itself is inherently bad, but I feel like the way in which the sex was presented as a reward for building up enough good poi points, either by selecting the correct dialogue choices or giving them gifts, was very icky. The second change I'm much less sold on, however. In what seems to be an attempt to be more inclusive, they made all of the romance options available to either male or female avatars, which in theory should be good. I mean, bisexual representation is a positive thing, but this again felt a lot less like bisexuality and more like a reward for the player for building up enough good boy points either by correct dialogue choices or by giving people a bunch of gifts that they like. And when I say the correct dialogue choices, this wasn't even like figuring out the characters and showing a genuine interest in them in order to build up the relationship that you want from a dating simulator. No, every dialogue had option wheels where you could be nice to them, be mean to them, etc, etc, and occasionally there would be a dialogue wheel to initiate romance with them. And if you select initiate romance, then they will be into you, no matter how nice or mean you've been to them in the past. Which was certainly a decision to make. It honestly made the romances feel less like part of a character development and more like just a reward for the player. And was especially silly when you could romance people who you are actively working against in the story such as romancing the mage while you are siding with the people who want to keep mages enslaved. While there were some limitations, it was kind of incredible how far you could push the boundaries. 
I might be misremembering, but I'm pretty sure you can romance a character who you threaten to sell into slavery. Despite the removal of the sex scenes, it really did just feel like titillation for titillation's sake, rather than character development. And the fact that these romances carried the same issues that I've harped on about with Fire Emblem avatars, in that they don't really change from gender to gender, just served to further reinforce that to my mind. Nobody's really bisexual, they're just sexually attracted to you, the Avatar, and no one else in the world. However, after two monumentally failed attempts, the Dragon Age devs seemed to take criticism fairly well, and presented a not perfect, but pretty darn good outing when it came to the romance options in Dragon Age Inquisition, the third installment. Here there were a wide variety of romance options, but rather than being available to anyone who wanted to, they would be limited based on who they were personally attracted to. For example, there's a heterosexual elf who is only interested in female elves. Meanwhile, there is a lesbian who's only interested in females, or a gay man who's only interested in men. Heck, one of the options wasn't even really a romance option, so much as it was an aromantic person who's perfectly happy to have sex with you, but not interested in any sort of relationship beyond that. While there are definitely areas where Dragon Age Inquisition's portrayal of queerness is worthy of criticism, I think that it succeeds in a lot of ways that Fire Emblem has yet to, and there is potentially some stuff that modern Fire Emblem can learn from if it intends to continue down the path of adding dating simulators to every new Fire Emblem game. Part 3, the issue with S supports and the potential path forward. Okay, so as things currently stand, the dating simulator slash romance aspects of Fire Emblem have quite a few issues. The first one I've talked about several times in this video, but it bothers me to no end that the supports and romances do not differ depending on whether you're a male or female avatar, other than just pronouns and gendered words. I'm not looking for major overhauls, and I don't want the avatar to feel like a completely different character depending on what genitals you give them, but I do think that gender does play a part in some of the interactions, and it's frustrating when the game doesn't reflect that. This is especially the case when it comes to the romantic portions of the supports, which is why I bring it up to begin with. The bigger problem, however, is that the romances don't feel like they're actually there to expand on the characters themselves, but just to be something for the player to want to attain. This is the reason that I brought up the seemingly unrelated Dragon Age stuff. It's because the characters in Modern Fire Emblem, at least as far as the romance aspect goes, feel very similar to the romanceable characters in Dragon Age 2 as opposed to in Dragon Age 3. They're all just attracted to the player character, regardless of anything else. They've basically all become corn sexuals, or robin sexuals, or whatever avatar sexuals. They lack any sort of agency or romantic desires of their own, and instead simply exist for toys that you decide you want to marry now. This is especially true in Engage, where the characters don't even have any paired endings outside of the one with Alir. So they really are just characters without any sort of agency or goals of their own, who you as the player can decide you think is pretty and therefore want to make your wife or husband. And like, this hurts their character, but it also has some knock-on effects as just the options we have in terms of different types of characters sort of dry up. For example, we can no longer have ugly behemoths like Gonzalez or Mally couples like Louise and Pent, because what if the player character finds them attractive and now wants to marry them? Because first and foremost, all of the characters need to be fuckable, we limit ourselves on the type of characters that we can have. Speaking of the characters needing to be fuckable, that's only halfway true. The characters need to be fuckable from a heterosexual stance, which means that we can't have any ace or gay or lesbian characters, but they'll throw in a couple of bisexuals so that the gays aren't completely starving. At least that's the approach that they took in Three Houses, which I do think is a better approach than the one they took in Engage, where just everyone became bisexual because fuck it, you want to fuck Marin, you get to fuck Marin. You want to fuck Tamara, you get to fuck Tamara. You want to fuck Pandrea, you get to fuck Pandrea. On the surface, this seems to be more inclusive. After all, it's not centering straightness as the default and gayness as the extra. But in reality, I think it's actually less inclusive than the Three Houses system was, because at least Three Houses had some people who were monosexual. 
And like, I don't think that the straights are dying for representation, but I do think it's a net loss when we have no monosexual people. Like, the fact that all of the characters in Engage are able to S support either male or female Olnir further cements them as just sort of being in the position of being the player's plaything instead of fully formed characters of their own. It's frustrating because I feel like ideally the romance aspect should allow them to become greater characters. Someone who the Avatar gets to know more deeply and you get a more personal sense of who they are. You feel closer to them, but instead I feel that the dating aspect tends to give me at least the opposite reaction where I no longer feel close to these characters because they're no longer really characters to an extent. I don't think we need to ditch the romance aspect altogether. In fact, I would say that the romance aspect is a big part of Fire Emblem and is a good thing overall, but it needs to be reworked such that it builds up the characters and allows for characters of all stripes. You shouldn't be able to romance every single character, whether you're a girl, a guy, or anything in between. We should be allowed to have some straights, some gays, some bi's and pans, maybe some asexuals, maybe some people who are already dating others, and maybe even, call me crazy, some people who are just not romantically interested in the Avatar. And I firmly believe that until we do that, we not only have a system that hurts queer representation, but hurts the characters in the game overall. But that's just my opinion. What do y'all think? I know that the dating simulator aspect of Fire Emblem is a contentious topic, either for new school fans who really got into the games because of it and think that it's the best part, or old school fans who absolutely hate it and wish that the face pitting simulator would get out of their strategy game. So I know there's a lot of strong opinions. I ask that if you want to discuss this, please be civil to each other in the comments section. It is just video games at the end of the day. Uh, but let me know what you think, and while you're down there, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube stuff. And the most important thing is have a wonderful day. Goodbye, y'all.